truly honored to present the 2015 Effingham Citizen of the Year, Mr. Craig Lindell. Well, thank you. It's delightful to be here with you today. And if, if you wouldn't mind uh, allowing me just a moment of personal privilege, for those of you who know me and are from here, it's been an interesting two or three weeks here. And I just want to say just thank you for all of that. It's a bit overwhelming and way too much and all that, but I just appreciate it. And thanks for letting us film this today. As I travel around the country and speak about all this stuff, sometimes they want to see clips that show that I can actually get through a sentence or two at a time. And so it helps to have <clears throat> a clip. I also will just say this, why do you cough at that? <laughs> all right, I gotta start again. And uh, I, I just wanna say that, uh, I'll just say this once, my mind is completely random. And so I make no apology or further explanation for my remarks today, which are all over the place, but it's just, anybody who knows me knows there's four or five things going on at the same time. Sometimes you miss part of the inner dialogue and we move on. It's just the way it is. And the way I kind of handle it is if you don't get it, I figure you're just not smart enough to get it and I move on and I feel good and everybody's okay. There are several sections to what I want to talk to you about today. You've, you've gotten some really nice, specific, practical information today, some nice inspiration. I want to give you some overarching things to think about today where you can apply these things to many parts of your life and maybe help you understand how to take what you've learned today and use those in various parts of your life. And then some of what I have to say has no redeeming value at all. And once again, I make no apologies for that. <clears throat> I've been asked to, uh, to start by talking a little bit about where the CEO network is, sort of the state of the, of the network. I'm happy to do that. Many of you know I'm the executive director of the Midland Institute for Entrepreneurship, which is an investment in the future by Midland States Bank. It's a very entrepreneurial venture on behalf of a very entrepreneurial bank. And Susan Hanflan is here with me, Liz Repke is here with me, they both helped me do this work. It's amazing to see what's happening here. When we started this thing, it was just here in Effingham, obviously. Well, we started our expansion in the fall of 2012, when we doubled the size of the network. And then the... <laughs> oh, that you think is funny. Well, boy, this is going to be rough. That wasn't really a joke. So then... But I know you all feel so smug that you got the math down. Because of one to two, I get it. It's... And then the following year, we almost tripled. So in the fall of 2013, we went from two to five, which was great. And then for this fall, we almost tripled again and went to 14. And then we thought, you know, this is a little fast. So this coming fall, we're only going to double in size. And we'll be 28 programs in Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Missouri. If we took everybody who was really serious about CEO, you can see we'd already be all over the country. And so CEO has kind of started to move up its own weight. We hear, I don't really have to tell people anymore, this is what it is, you should be interested. People come to us all the time about things. Just in the last week, I've met with people in Tennessee, South Carolina, and Minnesota, who really are serious about starting clusters of classes, which is cool. And it's all because of the people here who've made this such a success. And isn't it amazing what young people are capable of when you just allow them to own their work own the behavior, be responsible for what they do. That's where you get this. When you put them together with adults who have lots of things to offer, that's where the magic happens. And it does happen. And Effingham has always been kind of the, the lead class. Well, they're going to have a second class here this fall, which is terrific. And uh, Kent Probst, who doesn't like to be public or recognized like this, has done a great job of facilitating this class. Christy Sayers is going to join in this fall. Lisa Teichmiller has come aboard as a network developer. This program is just, it's moving this way and this way. It's just terrific, the stuff that's happening here. And I congratulate all of you CEO students on putting this together today. It's fabulous. <laughs> Did that sound sincere? Because I was trying so hard <laughs> to sound like I meant it. <clears throat> Actually, when I move around the network and talk to our, our kids in different places, it's really the only part of teaching that I just, it's just really hard for me to, be, to not be a teacher. It's just to be around the kids and stuff. But now I try to think that I've got kids spread all over the place, and it's sort of like an NBA player. <laughs> and that just sort of fell out. I, yeah. With this kind of brain, sometimes I hear at the same time you do, and 
My wife's in the audience, so I'll hear about that one uh, later on. <clears throat> so thanks for all the support that you give all of this and make it possible. I want to talk to you first today a little bit about these people who are in the class, because those of you who are in business are either working with or thinking about hiring the people we call millennials. And I want to spend just a little bit of time helping you understand why this is the greatest generation of people we've ever produced. They're not without fault, but they're terrific people. Depending on who you listen to, they were born somewhere between 82 and 02, depending on whose figures you look at. As of today, they outnumber us baby boomers. Doesn't it seem weird, those of us who are baby boomers, to hear that our generation is starting to die off? And on Facebook not too long ago, I saw a post from a millennial that said, I'm sorry, we're so terrible about everything. I just can't wait till all you baby boomers are dead. <laughs> Which seemed a little extreme, but you know, it's Facebook. It would not surprise you to know that this is the most technically literate generation, it better be, and that they're the most educated we've ever produced. It may surprise you to hear that they're not mostly, as a generation, motivated by money. They want a workplace where their work members are family, and where there's a nice work-life balance, and where their work means something, which is a change from those of us who are a little older than that. Gallup has found that almost every kid says they want to be an entrepreneur. But my guess is that of the 77% of kids, about 80% of those really don't know what it means. It just sounds cool. It's sort of like the little kid who wants to be, I either want to be a robber or a fireman or a big guy. I want to be one of those. Well, that's why we're here, is to help them understand exactly what this means. So they bring to us a capacity to learn and change and innovate like we've never seen. But here's where the gaps are. I spoke to a group of college students, uh, well, I'll save that, but they have the skewed sense of what it means to be fair or responsible. So if I studied three hours for the test and I got a D, clearly the test was unfair, right? And I see all the millennials going, dang right. Because <laughs> if I put in three hours, I better get a freaking A. Are you kidding me? And school people live in fear of the parent going, you know, they meant to study. They're very busy. This is not fair. And then at school, we have to go, oh, OK, I'll give them a 98 instead of 100. But it's only because they never turned anything in. And they have this sense as a generation that being responsible means, yeah, I meant to do that. It's exactly the same thing as it's done. So as long as I have an explanation that is reasonable, that I put in a reasonable effort, it's the same thing as if it's done. And then one of my favorite millennial responses is, well, what do you want me to do? I meant to do it. What do you want me to do? And you say, what I asked you to do? I mean, I thought it was fairly clear. Take out the garbage. I was doing something else. I didn't do it. What do you want from me? To take the, right? <laughs> but before you feel too superior about this, guess why they're like this? They're not entitled. They're well trained. We've done this. We have trained them to be like this. From the first day of kindergarten, it's every reward gets an effort. I went to a cheerleading competition last year, and every team got a first place. First place platinum, first place gold, first place silver, because for Pete's sakes, you're all winners. <laughs> well, the self-confidence that we develop when we tell them everything's great is so brittle that now they get into the workplace, and that's where employers get frustrated, because they say, you haven't done anything for a week? Well, no, it didn't work. What do you want me to do? I mean, I don't know what to do next. They need help with that kind of thing. I started to tell you, I spoke to a group of college students a few years ago, and you could tell they were forced to submit questions. They were horrible questions. But this one caught my eye. Now, if you read it, it's, it completed the assignment, because there is a question mark, and it's all English words. <laughs> so they did submit a question. And I said, you're going to have to help me out here. I'd be happy to answer this if I knew what you wanted to know. And the kid goes, oh, that was me. I just want to know like, what motivates you. And I said, OK, but that's not what that says. <laughs> The response is what tells us about millennials. The response was, it's what I meant. <laughs> like it's my fault that I couldn't get from that that this was, right? So millennials do have these gaps in what their strengths are. There's a new thing called hackademics. I'm not sure if you've heard this term before, but hackademics is where young people particularly develop their own skills and competencies instead of doing college, particularly in technology, in graphics, in the arts, things like that. Well, this organization, uncollege.org, advises academics on how to do this. Do you know what had better scare colleges and universities? 
As I travel around the country, which I do most of the time, I'm starting to hear with great regularity from employers the college diploma no longer is the divider for me because it doesn't tell me what I want to know. That's a scary thing. And what kids will start to do is just go around us if we don't start to change the way we do some things. But here are the top five skills, according to uncollege.org, that academics need. I love this one because if you can't write and communicate, you have problems in this world. If you're going to work in the world of technology, you better speak the language of technology, and I totally agree with that. We may not always like the way they do it, but millennials know how to network. They know how to connect. We may not like how they do it or what they do it for, but they know how to connect. And then the spirit of entrepreneurship that they deem so necessary, I totally agree with. Do you know where they need help? This is the top five things. <laughs> and guess what the response would be if you called them on it? That's what I meant, but, right? So the good news is that what they have and what baby boomers, those more experienced people have, fits together just like this. That's where CEO comes in. You take these tremendous skills that they bring to the table and then you marry it with people who have the life skills that are necessary to be successful and amazing things happen. I believe that we're in a period of time like the late 1800s, early 1900s, where things were being invented and innovated that changed profoundly everything about us. The way we communicated, traveled, worked, thought, everything. All right? Back in those days, it also took 25 to 30 years for things to really make their way around our society and be generally accepted. Do you know how long it takes now? <laughs> 20 minutes? Not very long. You know? It come, and then it's gone again. So what happens in my sort of amateur historian view is that after these things are invented, you have a period of time where it's bigger, better, faster. So automobiles are fundamentally the same thing they were 100 years ago. They're just bigger, better, faster. All of this stuff came about and then it was just improved upon. I believe we're in the same kind of period of time right now, except it's happening much more quickly and much more profoundly. But the way we communicate and think and work and travel and all of that is changing every day. Is there anybody in this room old enough to remember typing on a typewriter? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't admit it, just don't be so <laughs> anxious to admit it. Do you remember what it was like to get towards the end of the line and you're trying to think of the word you want to use, but you're not entirely sure how to spell it or hyphenate it. You don't know where the dictionary is in the house, so you don't use that word. Do you remember getting down towards the bottom of the page? You don't like the sentence and you're going, I'm not typing this whole page over again. I'll just make this work somehow. Do you remember this action? T backspace, T backspace, T backspace, R. Do you remember that? Do you remember the moment where you pulled the paper out of the typewriter and discovered a mistake and tried to get it lined up again? Or worst of all, when you found an extra letter when you pulled the page out? So typing on a typewriter was fundamentally about mechanics and logistics. It was about getting it down on the paper. Typing on a computer is about content. It's about what you're trying to say. That's a huge change. You don't worry about spelling or hyphenating or really some people about grammar or spelling at all. <laughs> Some people don't know that the red line under means it's misspelled, or the green line means maybe you want to take a look at the way you've put it together, or that you use punctuation. I used to have a student who would send me emails that were like this long, and they were all caps and no punctuation and all one paragraph, all one sentence. It was hard to get through it. So we know that this change in the way we do things is profound, and it's also great. It's wonderful that we've changed that. I don't know about this one yet. GPS? because I know I'm in the right place, but I have no idea where I am. I travel most of the time, and I'll be in a place, and uh, if the GPS didn't work, I'd have to live there, because I wouldn't be able to find my way back out <laughs> of where I was. And I don't know yet if this is a good thing or bad thing. I don't know how to shoe a horse, but we, I get along fine. Oh Well, sometimes I help my wife with stuff, but, <laughs> well, she throws a shoe, I feel like I need to get in there and do something to help. Oh, I see you're taking that in the wrong, uh, yeah. <laughs> she thinks that stuff's hilarious. <clears throat> so we'll just have to see over time how important some of this technology is and how important some of it isn't. Now, I want to share some stuff with you. This has no redeeming value, this next series of things. But I travel probably 80% of the time now, and I'm all over different kinds of places in the country. I fly, I drive, I take the train. And I just want to share with you some wisdom 
Now, some of you who heard me speak at First Friday a month ago, I tried out some of this material on you. Don't act all superior that you've heard some of this. Laugh like it's the first time you heard it, all right? So this is just stuff I've learned on the road, little pearls of wisdom. When you travel, there is the getting there, there is the staying there, and there is the eating there. That's pretty much what travel is about. But there's also the being there, okay? And I want to share just a couple of things about being there that I'm not making value judgments, I'm just sharing what I've seen. I spoke in New Orleans a couple of months ago, and it was same suit day. <laughs> this, I know, it's rippling toward, I forget where I'm at, I'm effing them, I gotta slow down, sorry. <clears throat> towards the back of the room, they're going, well, they're all wearing the same, oh, I get it, that's what he said, <laughs> I get it. This picture doesn't do it justice because there were probably 30 or 40 guys in the same light gray suit walking down the street. I just would love to know what was going on. I was in a hotel the other night and worked out and I found this on the treadmill. <laughs> I just wish I'd have walked in when the guy was going, I'm trying to keep up. At <laughs> Occasionally when I travel, I ask questions like, where's Chucky? And then I found out He's right down there. But then I didn't go down there because I thought, well, if I get Chucky, then what am I going to do with him? And then I found out, well, <laughs> you can store. And they could not be more accommodating because we store <laughs> Chucky. Can you imagine the conversation about, I don't think that looks right. Well, look, it says storage. We store. It says right there. And for months, I wandered this country saying, where is the FOD? If we could just put the FOD in one place, then we'd know where we could find it. And then I went through a town in southern Illinois, and there it is. <laughs> they put it all in the FOD center so that you can find it when you need it. And then occasionally, you see things that just defy any sort of description. <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking, if I drive down this road, am I going to find a bunch of pigs going, hey. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> I think we all know that the world's largest dragonfly exists. I mean, for Pete's sakes, we all know this. But did you know its name is Marty? And you can see it if you just drive down the right road in northern Minnesota. <clears throat> now, in the getting there, I have to say that in terms of our national security, the two greatest threats in our airports and national security are 90-year-old women and me. <laughs> so when I go through the security line, I think I look like this, all right? But evidently, this is what I'm putting off <laughs> as I go through. So the thing where they, they put your suitcase through the screener, so I'm going through there, and this lady says, is this your bag? And I said, yeah. Is this your bag? Yeah, I think it is. Don't you stand over there. You come stand right here. This is your bag? Yeah, I believe it is. Do you have hair product in this bag? I said, uh, could be. Is it like about that big? Don't you come through my line with hair product in your bag. Meanwhile, I'm hearing this from all around me. <laughs> while the guy in front of me is putting the machine guns and the rocket launchers and stuff back in his bag that fell out. <clears throat> and I'm the guy getting strip shirts because I got hair product in my bag on accident. It's just my life. Uh, Jack Schultz and I went through Williston, North Dakota, which has an airport about the size of this stage. And they're all the big, rough and tumble looking oil guys. Who gets pulled out of line to get strip search? It's just me that gets pulled out of line, because clearly those guys are all OK. So then when I get on the airplane, <laughs> if, well, let me just say this. So I was flying from Atlanta to South Carolina. And the seat next to me by the window was open. And those of you who fly, you know what I'm talking about, because the door's about to shut, and you're thinking, nice. And then you have the person who gets on the airplane, and I already know where they're going to sit, right? <laughs> and she comes toward me and gives me that look that you give to the person, and you go, sorry, it's my seat. She's about 70, very elegantly dressed. She's carrying a Louis Vuitton purse, very elegant. As she starts to make her way by me to sit down, she says, I'm like that, and about that time, this waft of hit me. And she says, I'm so sorry. I just vomited all over myself. I had to choose whether to make the flight or clean up, so I just sort of. 
And uh, sometimes you're not exactly sure what to say <laughs> to people. She said, uh, I think I got some bad pizza in Denver. And I said, yeah. I... <laughs> so when the flight attendant came by and said, would you like a drink or a snack? I'm like, I'm full on pizza. I, I could really not do another thing. <clears throat> now, people have asked me, as some of you know I've written a book, and some of you know I drive a Prius. Some of you know I take a lot of grief for driving a Prius. Some of you are, are instigators in me taking a lot of grief. So for my second book, this is at least going to be a part of it. It's things you can't do with a Prius. Now, I also want you to know that if you, uh, I'm a little nervous about these, you're going to have to use several skills in this because I'm going to talk to you. There's going to be something on the screen that you have to sort of absorb. And then you're going to laugh because this is comedy gold that you're about to see. If you don't get it, it's your fault. Because I'm telling you right now, this stuff's freaking hilarious. OK? So here are some things you cannot do with a Prius. You can't pull one of those great big campers <laughs> with a Prius. If you drive a Prius, there's a certain amount of road rage that's sort of directed to you. And if you feel it in return, you can't really say it, because everybody around you is like 50 times bigger than you. So all you can really do is say to yourself, I'm very unhappy, like that. You can't really drag race much in a Prius because the other guy won't wait for you. If you want to be cool, you can't exactly attach a sidecar for your dog because it just doesn't really go well. And probably my biggest regret about the Prius is that you can't really be a tough guy. Keep, you just got to. Because see the shirt that says, I heart 50 miles a gallon? <laughs> yeah. It's funny, though. All right. And then when you're traveling, of course, there's the eating there. And some places like Chicago or a big city, there's too many choices, too many places to try to eat. And then sometimes you stop at the hotel or motel desk and you say, any good place to eat around here? <laughs> and when they pronounce it, well, we've got the restaurant. And then you go there, and that's actually what it says. <laughs> yeah. And then this next one my wife is not going to approve of, but I, I'm sort of immature. Before you see it, I just want to say to you that before I saw this, I thought the only way I could do this was to go to my Aunt Erlene's on Thanksgiving, and get a couple extra helpings of the oyster dressing. But if you go to the right place in Minnesota, you can just pick it up anytime you want. <laughs> I know some of you are going, plates, bowls, and cups? <laughs> What's the big deal? In Minnesota, Holiday Gas is a company, right? So it's, it's not funny in Minnesota, but I can't drive by any one of those without laughing real hard. Because I'm 12 years old and go, hmm, I could stop and get holiday gas. <laughs> I used this in Kokomo, Indiana last week. Six people came up to me afterwards. I'm not kidding. Raging in age from junior high boys to like a 90-year-old guy saying, I don't know if you've seen it, but about five miles south of here is a place that says, eat here, get gas. Make sure you get a picture of that one for when you <laughs> go. So people are all like, oh, that's not funny. And then they can't wait to get up and tell you this, these things. And I have learned a few essential truths as I travel. Last week, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. I went into this filthy bathroom, filthy bathroom. And I'm always amazed when I see stuff written on the wall in a filthy bathroom, because I'm like, who spends that much time? <laughs> and when it's etched on the wall above the urinal, my new life philosophy is that anybody who stands in a place like that long enough to etch it deserves to have their saying read and recognized. <laughs> Just keep sounding out. You'll be fine. I swear you'll be fine. And then I measure distance as DBDQ, the distance between Dairy Queens. Because when you travel as much as I do, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that's what kind of keeps you going. But I get insulted sometimes in the Dairy Queen. So I went to one in southern Illinois. In fact, there's some people here from Montgomery County. It was in Montgomery County. Yeah, don't clap yet. So <laughs> I went in, and there was a guy in front of me who was probably about 90, I would say. 
And he said, not to the girl, but the lady behind the counter, could I get the senior discount? And she gives him one of these <laughs> for about 10 seconds. And then she goes, OK, like that. I'm like, wow. So I step up. I order my thing. She goes, it's 217. I said, sure, it says 238 up there. Oh, I gave you the senior discount. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This guy's on his way to be embalmed. Just made one last stop at the Dairy Queen, but you're sure I'm, I appreciate it. <clears throat> I spoke to a group of high school students not very long ago, and I was telling them about all the incredible technology that's coming our way in the next five or 10 years. So we got to the end and I said, any questions about anything? And this girl in dead seriousness says, yeah, are you sorry you won't be around to see any of it? <laughs> yeah. To which I said, would you close your eyes for a second? I want to see how peaceful you're going to look after I knock you out. <laughs> and of course, good communication is at the heart of a lot of what we do. One thing we don't want to do on cell phones, of course, even though that's why they were originally designed, is we don't want to talk on them, right? So we text. And when you text, we love it because there's no tone. We forget that. No, we actually don't forget that the sender doesn't assign the tone. The receiver assigns the tone. So if we were to call somebody and say, I'll be there in a minute, we can tell them by our tone what we mean. Be there in a minute. I'll be there in a minute. I'll be there in a minute. But when you text it, if you just send it like that, that's the message the recipient gets. Why do you hate me? Right? So then what we do is just make sure that everybody, we're excited. So we send it like this. Oh, sorry, I got to break off. This is just a warning. Because there's people my age in this room. If you mean to text the word OK, don't text the letter K. Because you think you're being hip, and you think you're being like cool. K means you're mad. OK? K means it's not good. It's not short for OK. It's like K. <laughs> the only thing worse than this is to go K dot dot dot. Because <laughs> K dot 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 means there's some stuff I want to say to you, but I'm going to freaking hold my so if you have children, and you're my age, and you go, OK, dot, 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 and they go, what did I do? And you go, you know. OK, so back to our message. So if you want to text them, you really got to go, I'll be there in a minute, three exclamation points, OMG, LOL, BFF. <laughs> and I say, we really ought to be required. If we're going to text like that, we have to say it like that. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> I'm so your best, <laughs> right? And then we're not sure, because they might think we're making fun of them, so we add, hashtag, you're the best, hashtag, can't wait to see you. <laughs> and then, just in case you're not getting me, I'm going to add just a couple of emojis <laughs> so that you know. And then I'll just make sure that you're with me. I just wonder if one of these days, somebody's going to go, I think I'll just call and just say it. <laughs> right? Well, communicating with people and understanding other people is at the heart of what success really is in business, in life, in your family, and everything. And as some of you know, I did write a book. It's called Things You Wish You Knew Yesterday. If you don't have a copy, it's quite a coincidence. There are copies for sale outside. <laughs> so if you'd like to have 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 of them, I think you should stop by and have it. And for most of you, there's enough pictures you're going to be fine. You sound out two or three of the key words and look at the pictures, I think you'll be, you'll be all right. So I want to share with you just two or three lessons from the book. I've used most of these for most of my teaching career. It's the stuff that kids come back and tell me, that's what I miss, that's what I remember, that's what I took from our time together, other than you are odd. <clears throat> this is so critical in terms of professional and personal relationships, is that most often when there's conflict, it's because you're not talking about the same thing. And I'm talking particularly now to the young people who are in the room. You're trying to balance school and maybe sports and homework and applications and what college am I going to go to and what major am I You're feeling the pressure of all of this stuff, the weight of all this stuff. All you need is your parents to add to that, right? To be on your back about this stuff. So your mom comes in and says, did you fill out that college application last night? I want you young people to know that the 30 seconds before she asked that question, she's saying to herself, I do not want to ask this, because I already know the answer. I know I'm going to get my head bit off, but it's important. I've got to ask it. So she asked, did you do that? And you go, maybe if you quit bugging me, I'd do it, <laughs> as if it's her fault somehow that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. You're not talking about the same thing. 
you think she's talking about, okay, so I didn't do it last night, big deal. She's talking about you living in the basement when you're 40. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, these are the same parents clapping, by the way, who have trained the kids to be like this, you know? <laughs> yes, I'll call the school. You meant to do it? I'll call it. I'll get her to hate. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So you're not talking about the same thing. One of you is talking about this, and one of you is talking about this. Do you remember when you were 10 years old and your parents were yelling at you and would not let up? And you're staring at the bedspread and your shoes and the carpet, and they just won't let up. It's because you're not giving off the signals that you get that this is about this. And do you remember when your seventh grade girl came home and said, my life is over. And you said some version of, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. It's a little bitty thing. And they go, you don't get it. Because you don't. To them, it's this big. It's about mattering, about fitting in, about finding their way in the world. To you, it's about one day in seventh grade, which is so long ago, you can't even remember if you were in seventh grade. <laughs> so just know that when you're talking about something, in conflict, whether it's a coworker, an employee, a family member, it's because one of you is talking about this and one of you is talking about this. Life gives us tools in a completely random order. This is one of the things I don't like about school, is that we spend 12 to 16 years training kids that week one, week two, week three, this is the way it goes, sorry if you don't get it, we're moving on, this is the way the world happens. And then we all get out into the world and go, did I miss something? Because it never comes like that. I would love for it to be like that. Well, life gives you these tools that you need to be successful, but it gives you in a totally random order, and sometimes life gives you tools that you go, I don't know, life doesn't seem to know what this is for. I don't even know why I have this. In school we go, this is the tool, this is how you use it, I'm gonna watch you do it, all right? And then when a student is presented with the same sort of situation, the student says, can't be, I already did that. It must be a different tool for this. So they can take this tool and know that it's for this and turn six inches to the left and go, I'm not, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I want kids to discover and people to discover, you know what else I could do with this? I can do the same task over and over. I could also do this. And maybe you'll be the one who discovers something completely new to do with that tool that nobody ever thought of. And now you're the professional wrestler called the hammer. So when life gives you these tools, no matter what order you'd like to have them in, accept them and keep them and look for opportunities to learn how to use them and how to use them in new ways. I love to share this story. When I used to teach little kids, fall of the year, usually first grade, some kid would come in for recess in the afternoon and he'd be digging in his pocket and he'd go, I brought you this. And he would hand me a Buckeye. And the kid wasn't articulate enough to say it, but here's what they would say. I picked this out for you, and it's like the coolest thing. You can shine it up, it just keeps getting shinier. You can carry it with you and it's good luck. You can plant it, and if you plant it, it might actually sprout. And if it sprouts, it could grow up into this huge tree, and you could climb in it, and then you know what else? You could put a tire swing on it. And if it gets hot, you can actually sit underneath it. And no matter what happens in the fall, you can jump in the leaves. This is like the best thing you could ever have. This is exciting. And even though we try to say it gently, here's what we say to the kid. First of all, I got a drawer full of these, right? Every day, one of you comes in with some great thing. You wanna see them? Secondly, it's brown. Even if it's shiny, it's just brown. It doesn't bring good luck. If you plant it, odds are it's not gonna sprout. If it sprouts, do you know how old you're gonna be by the time it gets that size? Tire swing? What do you know about putting up a tire swing? Where are you going to get the rope? Where are you going to get the tire? Do you have any idea the kind of liability you're introducing into our life by putting this up? If you were smart enough, you'd know this is not something to be excited about. And the kid kind of looks at it and he goes, wow, liability and trouble and uncertainty. I'm not sure this is worth it. And they tossed it away. And we put him through 12 or 16 years of this kind of training that you don't do stuff you don't already know how to do. You don't dream about stuff that you don't already do. And then what happens is new knowledge, new information, new experiences, new people become a threat because we don't know them. And I challenge you today to not let anybody take away whatever your Buckeye is, to be excited about it and continue to be excited about it. Shine it, carry it, plant it, enjoy whatever happens from that. I want to share a story with you that I don't, I've shared with students from time to time, but I don't think I've ever shared this publicly. 
When I was growing up, my parents had a couple that was their best friends, David and Jerry Carlton. David was a principal, Jerry was an eighth grade English teacher. My dad was a teacher, my mom was a teacher. They were best buddies, we did everything together, kind of grew up together. And when we became adults, my wife and I, and my mom and dad and David and Jerry often traveled and did stuff together. My students always kind of looked at me like, with your parents? But it was fun, my parents are cool people. And we did a lot of stuff together. Jerry was excited about everybody. When we were growing up and spending time at their house, hers was the phone that would ring at night. Some student had a problem, some family member wanted to talk about it, somebody she knew had some issue they wanted help with. Hers was the phone that rang constantly. I wanted to be like that. I didn't want to be a teacher, but I wanted to be somebody like that. When Beth and I would go do something, Jerry would come back and Jerry would say, I want to hear every detail. Some of you who are my former students have heard me say that to you. I want to hear every detail. This is where I got it. She was just excited. In the fall of 1985, I hope I don't, some of this is hard to tell. In the fall of 1985, on Columbus Day weekend, the six of us went to Atlanta for a thing. Jerry was not feeling good. Came back, turned out she was not feeling good because she had pancreatic cancer. She was dead very quickly, so we just didn't see her again. Her students, who, who loved her, said goodbye on Thursday, just didn't see her again. I'm still not really over this because I hadn't really started all of the cool stuff that's happened in my life, and I haven't gotten to tell her. And so a couple of months after she died, we were traveling, and I saw a ring, and I said, so I'm going to wear this ring. And some of you may have noticed over the years I wear an extra ring on this hand. And so every time I meet somebody famous, every time I do something cool, I feel like Jerry gets to be there. I always pat my students with my right hand. I always hug with my right hand. I feel like that's my way of making sure that what she meant to me gets passed on to the people who mean so much to me. That's the kind of person I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a teacher, but I wanted to be that kind of person. Teaching is what allowed me to be like that. But every good thing I've ever done is the light of somebody else shining through me. That's why I wear this. So if you start thinking back, if I ever pat it on the shoulder, it's always with this hand. I've always hugged, I always hug one armed and it's like this. It's just because I'm passing along Jerry. And all the cool stuff I've gotten to do, I feel like she gets to be there and she gets to be a part of it. She is what I would call a people magnet. I want to finish with this because it's so powerful. People magnets attract other people. Now. There are people who you see come around the corner and you want to run as fast as you can the other direction because they suck the life out of you. You know what I'm talking about? And suddenly you see when you're like, I got to go somewhere right now. <laughs> just, I've been known to wet my pants when they come around just so that they don't want any part of this. So if that ever happens to you, if you come around the corner and go, whoops, <laughs> you'll know. <clears throat> Sometimes there are people like this guy and they just want to criticize every single thing you do or say, and you feel like they're just waiting out there, and they go, you know, you said four, it's five. This is totally sideways, but when you get married, this is for young people. Do you know one of the things you're required to do for each other is to correct each other during stories? <laughs> and it's always detail that makes no difference. So a nuclear bomb went off about 4.30. <laughs> it was probably 4.28. It was... <laughs> then I killed three people. It was two. The third guy didn't die. So you got this guy who just wants to pick on everything you say. You got this lady who is completely unaware of the world around her. So when you say, you know, your hair's on fire, and she says, I did, everything's cool. And then you got this guy who we call must be nice because he deals with your success or your ideas by going, must be nice to have, and then you name it. You can fill in the blank any way you want. They suck the life out of you, and you feel like your balloon is just going, like you can feel it. Well, don't be too harsh with them. We used to do this all the time in class. We'd just do this. Just think about that. My mom, when I would come home and complain about these people, I wanted her to say, yeah, we hate them, don't we? They're terrible. She would always say, I wonder why they would act like that. She killed a lot of it. Well, <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, but they, I know, but why do you think they would act like that? That doesn't sound like them. It does too, it sounds exactly like them. <laughs> They're viewing the world like this. And when you view the world through this sort of thing, 
you only see a very small part of it. And if it was mirrored on the inside, you see everything with how does this impact me? How does this affect me? How does this make me feel? How does this make me think? And when you view the world like that, guess where your energy comes from? Sucking it out of other people. Not to get too metaphysical, but if you just turn that thing around, you see a much larger slice of the world, and you see how can I make them better? How can I make this better? How can I make the world around me a better place? When you live a life like that, you start to radiate energy. Sorry to be too metaphysical, but you just do. And when you do that, people start to come to you like they're feeding, like hummingbirds feeding off a bird feeder. Because they stand a little taller, they complain a little less, they work a little harder because they just feel good being around you. My challenge to you is to think about all of these things. When you have conflict with somebody, just do that. When you have tools that life offers you and you can't understand why, just turn around like that. When you meet somebody in your life who tries to steal your buckeye, just turn it around. You're not required to give it up. When you meet somebody who radiates energy and who shows you by their thoughts, by their words, by their actions, what is right and good in this world, start to focus your life this way. Because when you focus your life outward, it will be richer and more satisfying and probably more successful than you could ever imagine happening. I appreciate the chance to spend time with you today. I hope you had a wonderful day. Thanks to the CEO students. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you.